title of the sermon uh, this morning is the importance of being earnest. And I really wanted to bring in some, you know, uh, Regency era pictures and yeah, I, I don't know if it, Pride and Prejudice, anybody? Yeah. Okay. I, like, oh man. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't have said that previously, uh, but just so you know, I, I, I really enjoy um, watching and reading those period epics and the, the, the honesty, the directness is something that I'm wrestling with in this season of my life, and it's just really good. I, I, I like the word earnest. Um, now, when I say earnest, I grew up in the South, and I think of that, that guy named Ernest who made the, the, all those movies about Ernest Goes to Camp, and I, and I have to just back away from that because that's not what we're talking about this morning. Earnestness, uh, earnest, is, it means uh, a serious, it's the opposite of that guy, right? It's a serious and intent mental state. Earnest people are very serious and sincere in what they say and do because they understand that their actions and their beliefs are very important. Being earnest actually means that one is serious in their intention, serious in their purpose or their effort. They show deep sincerity. That's, that's really what this is. It's a deep sense of sincerity, a deep sense of feelings that align with what is true. And to some, being earnest is taken as being intense all the time or being so serious that a person isn't free to joke or laugh at things, but that's, that's actually not correct. Earnest people simply want to deal with what is true. And so the concept of being earnest is very closely related to the idea of being sincere, um, being genuine. We, we talk about an earnest attempt is, uh, is to make a genuine effort. Other synonyms would, uh, would, would include ardent, diligent, fervent, heartfelt, passionate. So, these folks, if, and you may, I don't, I don't know all of you well enough to know who's earnest in this congregation. I, I know some of you, and I'm trying not to make eye contact because um, <laughs> I don't want to identify. No, uh, commonly, you know, commonly we, we, we label it as too serious, too earnest, but, but really it's just passion. It's heartfelt sincerity. It's, it's something that we, we all ought to attain to more as we walk with the Lord. Um, maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe there's somebody in your life, a family member who fits that description. So somebody's going to ask, uh, and maybe you already are in your heart, how does a person become earnest? How does one cultivate earnestness? So let's consider that for a moment as we, as we move towards the text this morning. If your ambition was to become, uh, say, the best businessman or businesswoman possible, who would you study? Now just think about it for a minute. What, what, what if your ambition was to be a politician or an actor? Oh, wait, that's the same thing. Um, I digress. Uh, you would find the best in the field of study and you would study that person. You would study their life. You would study their habits. You would study everything you could find out about that person. And so given that we are all seeking God's will and his ways for our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, then we should be asking, what is God's ambition for my life? What does he want me to become? And the natural progression of this deliberate discipleship is to become, we, we actually become more earnest. The more we become like Jesus, the more earnest we are because we see the seriousness of what's happening in the world around us and we want to affect change by the gospel for good, right? And so um, there's this natural progression of this deliberate discipleship to become more earnest. This pursuit of becoming earnest is wrapped up in a Latin phrase that was used in the church um, called Christus Exemplar. That Latin phrase just means Christ, our example. Jesus is our example in everything. You want to know how to pray? Look at Jesus. You want to know how to share the gospel? Look at Jesus. 
You want to know how to love people who are unlovable? Look at Jesus. He's our example. That's why he came to earth, was incarnated, and all this to demonstrate for us what life with the Father should look like. And clearly, as we read and study the gospel accounts, this, this, this obviously includes being earnest. Being earnest is actually something that Jesus wants for everyone in his church. It's not, the, it's not converting your personality, okay? I think I thought that for a very long time. It's not, it's not, it doesn't mean you have to stop telling dad jokes. Praise the Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to be glum and serious all the time, right? It is for some of us, and this is autobiographical, uh, moving away from constant frivolity and distraction and instead embracing passionate diligence and true sincerity. And, and, and again, that, that hits home for me personally. I find that I'm actually overly casual in prayer, right? And some, of, some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I can identify. I'm overly casual in prayer until circumstances affect me and arrest my attention. Then I find that I'm very earnest in prayer. And that's the Lord's discipline. That's the Lord saying, yeah, you just kind of, you just kind of, everybody else is running the, you know, the hundred meter dash and you're taking a jog around, around the field, right? And so this is always God's way of getting our attention and just stop and think for a moment, what would become of us? What would become of our prayer lives? our marriages, our ministries, if we took the requisite time and were truly earnest in prayer, earnest in the pursuit of God. Now, prayer is, a, is its own topic. And, and, I, and I've asked the question so many times in my own personal walk with Jesus, why is prayer so hard? Now, for some of you, it's not. For me, it has been. So why is prayer so hard? We, for me, what, what I've discovered, what the Lord has said to me is we ha- I haven't learned to persevere in it. And there's a, my attention span is so short. I, I, it's like there's a, there's a long discipline of, of gaining that back, right? And so we need to ask ourselves a question, what things are keeping us from hearing God? What, what, what's keeping us from being in communion with him? And in a room this size with all of you here, that list would probably be pretty long, right? What things keep us from hearing God? But we could also find a core element of things that we mostly have in common when it comes to not hearing the voice of God. And one of those things that is mostly, I think, common to all of us in, 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 is a reality called, here's another big phrase, ready? ontological lightness. Okay. Um, to understand the phrase ontological lightness, ontology is our, our being. And then the idea that, uh, that we're light is like we're a feather. It, like uh, go watch Forrest Gump this week. And that feather at the beginning and the feather that's kind of flitting along at the end of the movie, that's Forrest Gump's life. He just goes wherever the wind takes him, right? That's ontological lightness. We're not grounded in anything. We're not moored to anything. We're not anchored to anything substantial. And and so um, so if you're like me, I I often feel restless and distracted. And um, there are like a hundred shattered thoughts flooding my mind, competing for my attention, particularly when I want to sit and read the word of God. And part of that's spiritual warfare, right? But, but I want to encourage you um, this week. I, I would just say, even this afternoon, go home and read 1 Kings chapter 19, right? Because there's this interesting conversation between Elijah and God about how weary the prophet has become. And he's been faithful to his office. He's been faithful to the mission that God's given him, but he's just worn out. And so he goes out into the wilderness to talk with God about being done. And and God has him appoint his replacement, Elisha, and then come, come, come out further into the wilderness to speak with God directly. And and you you know, the scene where God, God puts his hand over the cleft of the rock and and Elijah sees God's back and, um, and and he speaks directly to him. Here's the part that I think is really important for us in first Kings 19, it's verses 11 and 12. And he said, 
the, the Lord, uh, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Have you, I, I just haven't ever seen a wind break rocks. That's incredible to me. And, and it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, like a, like a I don't know, 11.0 or some crazy thing like that. But, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. And can you guess what the next phrase is? But, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. God wants to speak to us in whispers. And everything else is so loud and we're so distracted. And God just wants to speak to us in whispers. When we were kids, when our kids were small, we would tuck them into bed. And then Jen and I would talk in low voices in the quietness of the house at the end of a busy day. It was one of my favorite things, just trying to talk and, and not wake up the kids, you know. And that example underscores for us that our Heavenly Father wants to hear from us and he wants to speak to us, but we need to be in a place where we can listen to that. And so we have to be earnest in drawing near to him because when we do that, Scripture says, he draws near to us. That's what we want. So before we jump into the text, I I just want to make sure that you know that a, a longer version of this prayer that we're about to read in Luke 11 um, is given earlier in the gospel accounts. It's in Matthew 6. But clearly, um, you know, Jesus felt that there's a need for a refresher on how to pray. He's asked the question by one of his disciples here, which you'll see in a moment. We, we, we take this for granted because we know what Christ has already done for us. And many of us know this prayer from memory. I grew up in a more liturgical setting till I was about eight or nine, and, and, and recited this prayer every Sunday. So, so it's just wrote in my memory. But I would encourage you to, even in this moment, just ask the Lord to give you fresh eyes as we look at this text this morning. So, so, so Luke 11, 1 through 13, and we'll just go verse by verse here. It says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. So, so right off the bat, we see that we need to ask the Lord to teach us to pray. Well, there's nobody else to go to. There's no, there's no higher authority. Well, I, I talked to the Lord about my prayer life, but I'm really looking for an expert. It's like, what do you... Well, I, 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 I don't mean that we don't understand how prayer works. We're, just, we're simply talking to God. We're having a conversation with God. I mean, largely, uh, I, I, I won't say we, I don't want to include you. I don't know if this is true of you, but I largely uh, don't persevere in prayer over a long period of time. It's like, I prayed that. I asked for that. Where is it? Like God's my butler. Instead of coming back, instead of just communing with him, which is what he wants to be in relationship, right? Uh, we, don't, we don't persevere in prayer over time. We're shaped by our instant gratification culture instead of being shaped by God's word. And, and, and I want you to know, again, I'm going to probably say this a couple of times. This is autobiographical. Uh, that may not be true of you. I, I don't want to assume that it is, but I know for me, it, it, the prayer, consistent prayer, spending long periods of time praying and communing with the Lord in that context is not something that I find easy to do. And God is challenging me in this season of my life to, to work in, in that uh, setting and to, and to in, embrace that, even though it's really uncomfortable. And in the context of the passes, the disciples were learning to pray to the Father. They've been taught this before. They've been through this before, but they're getting a refresher. And, and that's a good thing too. That's not a bad thing. We all need refreshers from time to time. The Lord wants to hone the skill sets that he's building in us. He wants to refine us. And so uh, some people get hung up on which member of the Trinity we should pray to, right? And it can get tangled up 
in your mind. And, and, that, and that, that will inevitably keep you from praying. Right? So am I praying to the Father? Or is the Son going to be offended if I pray to the Father and not to the Son? Or can I even talk to the Holy Spirit? Right? What, what, what is, what's going on? Well, we can pray. Let me make it really clear. We can pray to the Father. And we can pray to the Son. And we can pray to the Holy Spirit. And they all hear us. All three members of the Godhead. God is three persons in one God. Now, don't ask me to explain how that is. Three persons in one God. One being three persons. I don't know. God is one what and three who's. Not the who's down in Whoville, just who. He's three. Anyway, it doesn't matter which member of the Trinity you call upon so long as you call upon him in prayer. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to pray to him. Verse two, and he said to them, when you pray, see the assumption? Not if you pray, but when you pray, say, here, here's a model for you to use. Not that you have to recite this rote prayer every time. Here's a model. Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. Now, please notice that Jesus said, again, when you pray, not if you pray. And, and, and people see prayer as the least thing that someone can do in the kingdom. I know I did for many years. You see that as the least thing that we could do. I wanted to do ministry, not spend time praying. Boy, that's, that's not seeing the big picture at all. But it was, that, that was only because I didn't understand either ministry or prayer, really, at that time. If it had not been for others praying for me as I went, most consistently my wife, my ministry to people would have fallen flat and been fruitless in any and every context. I didn't pray the way that I should in preparation. I prayed, and there were plenty of moments doing street ministry when I, <laughs> you're like, I better pray right now, or this is going to go badly. But, but in terms of preparatory prayer for, for a while, you know, long periods of time, man, it was just absent. And, and, and so prayer is the engine that drives us as Christians. Prayer is the engine that drives the church of Jesus Christ. It's why we as a church need to focus in on prayer in this season of the life of Emmaus Road Church. We, we, we participate in so many activities in our community. We have a great relationship with the city of Stanwood. I love that we get to do all that we do in terms of outreach and, and loving on people. But unless we're connected to Jesus in prayer, it's all going to be done in the flesh. So, we, so when we pray, we are to put first in our minds the holiness of God. We are approaching a being who has no sin whatsoever. We're approaching a being that you cannot touch, taste, feel, or see, but who is real nonetheless. And he's perfectly holy, which is why the mission of God towards humanity to make us holy is so important so that we can have communion and relationship and proximity to this holy God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, here's, here's the importance of holiness, the holiness without which no one can see the Lord. If we're not gaining holiness, cultivating holiness, receiving holiness from the Holy Spirit, from, from the Godhead, we're not going to see God. I mean, can you even imagine what it would be like one day in the future when we are glorified in his presence? If you put your faith in Jesus alone to save you from the penalty of your sins, listen to me, you are justified. It is just as if I'd never sinned. If you put your faith in Jesus, you are justified before God. And then here's the, here's the greatest the current, like present tense. You are being currently sanctified. Sanctus is the Latin for holy. And God is actually making you holy. He's working holiness into your life. Sometimes it's a blessed experience. Sometimes it's the hardest, most painful thing you can imagine but he's making us holy. So we're justified. We're being sanctified. And then at some point when Jesus sounds, he says, turns to the angel says, okay, blow, blow the trumpet. We're going boom, gone. 
And when we get into the presence of God, we will be glorified. No more sickness, no more disease, no more hurt, no more pain. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. We get new bodies. <laughs> Amen. I know. I tried to run the other day with the dog just across the yard. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh, my knees. We're going to get new knees, <laughs> new legs, new bodies. We're not going to be riddled with the curse. Our new bodies will never grow old, never get tired, never wear out because they're going to be perfect and everlasting. So Jesus goes on. He, he continues to school his disciples again here on how to pray. Verse 3 says, give us each day our daily bread. And bread in that context would have been matzah. It was a staple food for the people of Israel. And Jesus is using this common item to teach us spiritual truth. One of those truths is that we need connection to the Lord spiritually, just like we need food to live. And I don't lack food. I mean, just look at me. I don't miss meals. I love food. Do we love the connection with God as much as we love food? This is the parallel. This is the image. This is the, the word picture to help us understand how important it is to be connected to the life of God. Without consistent feeding on the word of God, our souls atrophy and weaken. And this is why so many believers are ineffective for the kingdom. Because in our weakened state, the temptations that come from without are stronger than they would normally be because we are weaker than we should be. We need to feed on God's word daily and so, simply not just reading the designated passage, which is not bad, but we need to chew on it again and again. It's like a cow chewing its cud. Jen and I saw this video uh, this week. It was so good. This, this rancher came out and, and, he, and he, one of his cows had died and you just had the skull of the, the cow and he was showing you how the back teeth, I don't even, I don't even remember all of it. The back teeth of the cow um, grind the cud, but it's the mechanism that gives us milk. Without that, we wouldn't get milk. And it was just this fascinating TikTok video. I think it was TikTok. I don't know. I don't. Anyway, but we, we, we need to feed on God's word and then just let it digest in us. Just, just let it, let it, sit in us. To meditate on God's words is like a cow chewing its cud. It lays in the field and, and, and as it stands or walks about, it chews its cud. That cow savors the grass in its mouth before filling its stomach. That, there's, a, there's a picture. And then it sits down in the meadow and quietly, um, here's a picture too, it regurgitates it. Um, and then it reworks it in its mouth again before swallowing it. Now that's probably not the picture you wanted. Um, that sounds gross, but it's the way that God made the cow's stomach to work. And, and it, it transforms that grass into rich, creamy milk. It's not just, hey, I read my, I read my section of the Bible today. I'm going to go on. It's gone. I don't even remember what I read this morning. So no, think about it. Come back to it. Open your Bible again. It's okay. You're not going to get penalized for opening the Bible a second time. Right? Read it again. Think about what it means. How does this apply to me? What, what, which part of this do I need to hold on to today? That's, that's the chew in the cud, right? And we need to do that. We need to learn how to do that. In the same way, the word of God is meant to become pure, sweet milk for us. First Peter 2.2, 2, when we meditate on God's word, we taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34. Our minds are renewed. Our whole person is transformed. Even as we read and pray the scriptures from our hearts, that's Romans 12. And so we're drawn into loving God more and growing and trusting his love and, and then sharing that love with other people. That's what he wants for us. So what do you need to do today? What actual provision? I want you to think about this for just a minute. What actual provision and spiritual sustenance do you need today? Have you, have you stopped to think and ask the question? And, 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 and don't, 
You, you can come ask me to pray with you after church, but you need to ask the Lord that question. You need to ask the Lord, what is it that you want me to have today? What do I need today? I don't even know what I need today. Lord, help me. Jesus said in John 6, I'm the bread of life. You remember that? We, we're, in, we're in John. And, and then Jesus said, come to me and I'll, I'll cause living water to well up within you. That was John 7. So 6 and 7, you got bread of life, living water. And that wasn't just for the Jews. That's for us. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's our sustenance. So, so ask God, why is giving you today's bread? What's it for? What's it for? What does he want you to do? Like the, the point of sustenance is so that your body works so that you can do something. So what does he want you to do with that? That's for us today to do God's will. How does he want you to minister to people around you? Basically, um, we need to pray like George Mueller. I don't know if you know who George Mueller is. Um, <laughs> so much to say about George Mueller. Uh, greatest of all, George Mueller's undertakings was the building and maintenance of the great orphanages at Bristol, England. This guy was a foreigner. Um, he came in to England at a time of great upheaval in, in, in Europe, and he began this undertaking to, to come alongside um, orphans and widows, but particularly orphans, and to build orphanages for these children so that they wouldn't be living on the streets and being taken advantage of. And he began this undertaking with, this is how much money he had at the very beginning, two shillings, two shillings. That is today's equivalent of 50 cents. He had 50 cents when he started in his pocket. But in answer to prayer and without making his needs known to any human beings, he received the means that were necessary to build great buildings and feed orphans daily for 60 years. Just asking the Lord. There'd be days where the kids had all assembled for breakfast and there was no milk. There was nothing to drink. And so George Mueller would come into the room with the kids and say, okay, kids, you know what we need to do? We need to pray. And they would stop and they would get on their knees and they would pray, Lord, give us this day the sustenance that you provided for us. Lord, we, we trust you. You're a good father. And there'd be a knock at the door before they were done praying. And the milk cart had broken a wheel right in front of the orphanage. I'm not going to be able to get this milk where it needs to go today. It's going to spoil. Can you use it? Again and again and again. We need to pray like George Mueller. And in all those 60 years, the children did not have to go without a meal. And Mueller said that if they ever had to go without a meal, he would take it as evidence that the Lord did not want his work to continue. And sometimes the meal was almost at hand that they didn't know where the food was going to come from. The Lord always set it before them in due time. What, what if, so what if we no longer cared about the accumulation of goods and comfort in this life? but instead began to redirect our efforts, energy, and resources to the things that are going to matter for eternity. What would happen? What if we lived that kind of faith? What, if, what would Christ do among us if we, if we begin to live like that? Verse 4, Jesus says, Forgive us our sins, for we, all, we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, and as we unpack verse four here, I want to stop and just warn you. What is a Christian? Nothing but a person who's received forgiveness from a holy God for innumerable, unspeakable sins against that same God who is holy. That's all we are. We are sin, sinful people who've received grace. And that's it. So, so let me say this plainly. plainly. If, if you, as a, as a blood-bought Christian, are harboring, incubating, and coddling hatred or unforgiveness towards another person at this time, especially a brother or sister in Christ, you are sinning and you are on dangerous ground. And I'm, I'm not talking about, you're just going to have to 
There's no consequences to their actions if they did something bad or wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm not talking about the removal of proper boundaries of the people in your life who are unhealthy. I'm talking about forgiveness and grace. I mean, this is the, this is the section of the prayer. Forgive us our sins. Yeah, forg- forgive me, Lord. Thank you. Oh, oh you mean, whoa, what, what did you say? As we ourselves forgive everyone who's done us wrong, who's in, well, I don't like that part. I don't like that part at all. I want your forgiveness. I don't want to give forgiveness to, well, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Forgiveness and grace. John 1, 16, 17, for from his fullness, we have all received, all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You've all received grace. How can you not give grace? Colossians 3, Paul puts it this way, verse 12 and 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones who are holy and beloved, put put on then compassionate hearts and and, and kindness and humility and meekness. and, 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 And here's my favorite one, patience. Bearing with one another. You know, you know how you bear with one another? They're hard to deal with. You've got to bear with somebody that you don't, I wouldn't choose to hang out with, or that guy aggravates me, or the, whatever it is. You've got to bear with them. Don't be a bear to them. Bear with them. Hey, but since, look, bearing with one another, and, and if one has a complaint against another, this is in the church, forgiving one another. Amen. Not glossing over. Not just letting it lie, holding a grudge, forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Oh, my goodness. Why do we do this to ourselves every week and read the Bible? It's hard. Lord, we need your spirit. Forgiveness from the Lord should be the thing that keeps us on track. And and keeps us away from more temptation. But too often, we treat the grace and forgiveness of our God as a small thing. We assume forgiveness. We presume forgiveness, which is just one small step from justifying our sin. Yes, we should stop. We should ask the Lord to forgive us every time we, we find ourselves sinning, even if it's a small thing. Once we begin to assume the forgiveness of God, we are presuming upon the grace of God. And he wants true, genuine repentance. And don't forget that God sees your heart plainly for what it is. So, oh, Lord, I really want to do better. And in your heart, you're like, not really. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want the status quo to change, really. But I'm going to say that, and he's not going to know. Pfft, what are you talking about? He knows. He knows the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. So Jesus said to these guys in verse 5, he said to them, which of you who has a friend would go to him at midnight and say, hey, friend, I know it's midnight, uh, but I need some bread. <laughs> Could you lend me three loaves? Because this guy I knew from college showed up at my house and uh, I don't have any food to give him. And so, and, and, and so, and so Jesus says, well, okay, so that, that friend, that neighbor's going to answer from behind a locked door, deadbolt door, right? And be like, dude, go away. Don't bother me. The door is now shut. My children are in bed. I'm not going to get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus says, so so, so he comes out of that that little story and he says, I'm telling you, though this man will not get up and give him anything on the basis of their friendship, on the basis of being neighbors, that's not enough to get this guy to get out of bed and come to the door and help. Yet, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. If you stand there and knock on that door long enough, he'll come to the door. You're not going to be happy, but he'll come to the door. And so Jesus sets before us the need of an inconvenienced friend. This friend 
here in this story has a guest. Whether he knew the guest was coming or not, we don't know, but he's arrived and the, and the friend has no food in the house. It's midnight, it's the middle of the night. And I just tried to think about how I would respond if one of my neighbors woke me up in the middle of the night to ask for Ritz and peanut butter. I would not be happy. They're like, what are you doing? Go down to the little quickie mart at the freeway and get something. Leave me alone. And I'd probably be answering the door with a shotgun. Right? And, and this inconvenience is not even for your neighbor's sake, but for someone who's a total stranger to you. They just showed up at your neighbor's house. I don't even know this guy. And the, the, the initial response in the neighbor is, Look, go away. Do you even know what time it is? You, you're going to wake up my kids. And if you wake up the baby, my wife is going to bury you in the backyard. What are you doing? So the fact that the neighbor is a friend here is not enough to compel the man to get up and help his neighbor. But if you keep knocking and pounding and loudly calling out on your, your neighbor's name through the door, at some point he's going to give in. He's going to come to the door and he's just, just to get you to go away, just to get you to shut up, stop. So before we conclude this passage, make sure that you understand this is not describing Jesus' disposition as we pray and knock on the door of heaven. This is the antithesis. It's a contrast. Look what he says next in verse 9. And I tell you, Jesus said, ask. And what? It will be given to you. You don't have to pound on the door for 45 minutes to get Jesus to come to the door. I tell you, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus is just waiting for you to ask. Because the Father delights in giving good gifts to his children. That's what he said in his word. But we should not presume upon God's graces. Instead, in humility and with a heart to do what is good and right, we come to him and ask, Lord, I need this thing. I need your power, your whatever it is in this moment for this thing, right? Seek and knock and it will be open to you. Ask without shame and embarrassment. Sometimes God gives us provision and grace because we don't know what we need or what we're going to need. But as, but as a general rule, we should be asking the Lord to, to give us what we need. The asker receives. The one who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door of heaven is open to him. And then we wrap up the passage here, verse 11 and 12. He says, well, what father among you? This is another illustration. What, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? <laughs> I mean, just think about like being on a family picnic and your kid's like, dad, I'm hungry. Can we bring some hard-boiled eggs? Hey, here, here, kid, eat the scorpion. That's, just, that's a terrible dad. It's a terrible dad. We have the Holy Spirit. How much more our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit to those who ask? We have, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to move us beyond the place of transferring our earthly dads onto our Heavenly Father. That's, that's where we get tripped up. And what I mean is some of us have a hard time relating to God because of the fathers that we grew up with. And, and, and we need to move to a place of seeing those men for who they are and, 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 um, and seeing God for who he really is and how he feels about us and, and coming to the place of forgiving our fathers, forgiving our parents for whatever they did or didn't do. And if we don't do that, we're not going to be able to spend time building relationship and communicating with our heavenly father because we're already confused and we're assuming things about him that might have been true about our earthly fathers, but that aren't true about him. It just gets so convoluted. And so we need clarity. We need the Lord to 
clear our minds ab- about these, these, these tangled webs that we've, we've made in our own minds, the, the things we've experienced. And God created the family to reflect that he's perfectly faithful. He's a generous provider. He's a loving and forgiving parent. He's a, he's a patient teacher. Amen. I'm so glad he's an understanding counselor and a wise communicator. He's strong, yet he's intimate with us. The Lord is affectionate and he accepts us. And the list goes on and on. Abba is there for you when you sin, when you fall, when you fail. He's with you when you're hurt, when you feel abandoned, when you lose someone to death, when you're rejected. He's right beside you when the love of others is conditional, when life is unfair, when a situation seems hopeless. And this is why in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, Jesus went to the cross to bring us to the Father. His death opened the way for us to enjoy intimacy with the Father. We have been saved for relationship. And if you're not receiving the love of the Father, then you're missing the reason for which you've been saved and the purpose for which you were created. The foundation and basis of our very identity in Christ is that we're precious children of the Father. Isn't that great? We're, we're children of our Heavenly Father. And that should, that should bring about some earnestness in us. Earnestness. We, we need to seek to meet the needs of those around us as we're able that endeavor to, 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 to minister to other people, to minister to the people in our community and in the church is predicated on God's love for us. Without that, we, we, we don't have any fuel for it, okay? And, and so God is not a grumpy neighbor like the man in the story who, who woke up in the middle of the night. He's the opposite, in fact. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. That's what the word of God says. And so we can go to him day and night. Knowing that we can go to him day and night, uh, my question for you is, are you earnest in prayer? I'm working on that. Still in process. I'm married to a woman who prays ceaselessly. I wish prayer were simply by osmosis. I could just sit by her on the sofa and pray. And she's praying, so I'm praying. But that's not how it works. And so it requires effort. It requires discipline, especially in the beginning. But when it's ingrained in your life, it's ingrained in your soul, you find that it's not a labor. It's a joy. And you don't have to schedule prayer and you don't have to write it down on your calendar. It's like breathing. It's what you do all the time. We need to ask God collectively and individually to instruct us on prayer as a church. The entire process is meant to bring us closer in relationship to him. And one of the purposes of prayer is for you and I to get to know and enjoy God as we spend time with him each day. It's not meant to be laborious. It's not meant to be uh, this heavy thing that we, oh, I don't want to do that today. It's meant to be a joy. James 4, 8 admonishes us to come near to God and he will come near to you. In addition to hearing the voice of God in our daily Bible reading and in our devotions, the Lord actually wants us to draw near to him and talk with him and then to listen to his voice, listen to his word. Prayer is a conversation with God. It's simply listening and talking. And you don't have to dial a number and hope that he answers. He's always available day and night, any hour. Again, he's not the man. He's not like the man who was woken up by his neighbor in need. He's not like that at all. Psalm 121 tells us that he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel does not slumber, nor does he sleep. When Jesus becomes our reality and our daily necessity, instead of just a concept in our minds, it's going to shake us. It shakes our lives. It moves us. You see, when when God is just a concept, it doesn't affect how you spend and give your money. It doesn't impact how you treat your, your family, the people around you, your spouse. When God is just a concept, how you treat your kids doesn't change. How you live your witness in front of your neighbors and coworkers doesn't change. Nothing in your life is going to change 
as long as God is just a concept. But when he's the reality, when he's the center, it changes everything. And, you, and you're undone. You're, you're well uh, tidy, well-built world is undone. But you have a relationship with the Lord. And one of the greatest needs in the church today is to understand this reality that we are adopted children of the Father, that he loves us dearly. For, for the embrace of that reality in our lives is going to open the doors that currently are closed to us. The number one tactic of the enemy is to destroy the character of God so that we live in constant fear, doubt, and unbelief. So I, I, I believe it's vital to learn God's character. It's vital to study his ways. And the way that we do this is through the word, through prayer, and communing with God. But understand, the first informs the second. Here's what I mean. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, Number one, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, because that's your spiritual worship. Your life belongs to him. If you put your faith in Jesus, present your body, this vessel to be used for God's purposes, whatever he wants to do. And verse two says, and then here's the other part. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world shape you in its image but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? God's word. Daily. Chew the cud. Right? Chew the cud. And and so do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what's good and acceptable and perfect. So so the yielding of our lives, a sacrificial worship, and the renewing of our minds by God's word is what frees us to walk in the love of the Father. And as we, so as we close this morning, allow me just to give you a few reasons to press in and to know the Father's heart more. I'll just give you a, a few, few verses here. John 1, 12, listen to this. He is our Father by right through the blood of Jesus. He came, he's our Father because of what Jesus has done for us. John 10, 28, he, the basis of our security is in the Father's hands. He says, I, I don't let anything slip out of my hand. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 tells us that the highest motivation of holiness is knowing the Father's love. When we know and, and embrace and immerse ourselves in the love of the Father, well, it's like, it's incredibly motivating for us. It motivates us to, to obey and to do what he said. Matthew 6, 9, the basis of our prayers is the Father's name, which reflects God's character. We can pray to him because he's good and he listens. Ephesians 3 tells us every family on earth derives its name from the Father. Colossians 1, our our relationship to him as Father is the legal basis for our inheritance, both now and the future, and and the Father seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth, which is what we're going to do right now. And I'll just close Uh, by reading an excerpt from C.S. Lewis. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong. This is the weight of glory, uh, incidentally, but too weak. He doesn't find our desires to be too strong. They're actually too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot even conceive or imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. 1 John 2, same concept. We'll close with this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Lord Jesus, would you help those words to sink down into our souls this morning? We would hear you understand your words and and take them in 
as food, as nourishment today, and that you would change us accordingly. We ask in your name. Amen. What if we no longer cared about the accumulation of comfort in this life, instead redirected our efforts, energy, and resources to the things that would matter for eternity? What if we lived that kind of faith? What would Christ do among us and through us if we were earnest in prayer? Pray that we would not be anxious about anything. Pray that we would in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our requests be known to God. Pray that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus in these dark days. Be earnest in prayer. Knock on the door of heaven. Our Father delights to give good gifts, so use those gifts to bring others to Christ. Emmaus Road Church, you are sent.